I didn't know what was worse, the swarms of flies crawling over me with their sticky paws, or the drying heat that evaporated even the saliva on my tongue. I stood up, grabbed my shirt, and waved it about, chasing the flies out of the cave. Despair settled in my soul. The sun was setting, and when I looked at my watch, I saw that it was already five o'clock. Soon night would come, my friend and protector, and hide me from human eyes. A tin can of sand soaked in petrol replaced my tile. Soon the aroma of coffee wafted through the cave. I hoped that no one walking along the shore would wonder where the divine odour was coming from. I satisfied my hunger with tinned meat. By this time, my pursuers must have found the Italian from whom I had taken the lorry, and he would, of course, tell them a very embellished story, after which the hunt for me would be resumed with renewed vigour. On the other hand, his story would cause the military police to look for the Italian lorry, and also to detain all suspicious Italians with blonde hair in the hope of catching me. So I changed into my German uniform and hid the Italian one. After that I sat down and began to think about what to do next. I needed a new car, fast, not too big and in good condition, but I couldn't go to Derna and check out every car I came across. I'd have to judge by looks. Deep in Cyrenaica, away from the sea and the main road. I'll be able to hide somewhere until I'm ready to move on. There I can stock up on provisions, water and patrol, but it's best not to think about that just yet. We've got to get there first. Coastal Cyrenaica was like a big oasis in the desert. The Jews had colonised it mostly in the last twenty years. It had one rather large city, Benghazi, while the others, Barca and Modern El Mar. Ed, Kirina, Modé, El Beda, Edidi and Tukra, Takra, were smaller. Before leaving Libya, I was going to stop at Benghazi, the main seaport of the province of Cyrenaica, and send some things to my mother, as I would not return home. At least not while the war was going on and God only knew how long it would last. When I looked out of the cave, I saw that it was getting dark. It wouldn't be half an hour before nightfall. I gathered my things so that when I returned, all I had to do was load them into the car. Two parabellums I shoved behind the shins of my boots, a pistol in each boot. I buckled my belt with six magazines for the machine gun, hung it over my shoulder, and taking my torch, walked cautiously out of the cave onto the beach. I soon found myself in the shadow of some house, and stopping, I scrutinised the main street that lay before me. The moon had not yet risen, but I could see the vague outlines of figures and hear people walking round me. Realising that I must not draw attention to myself, I stepped resolutely into the main street and began to make my way through the ruins. I had to walk along the carriageway, as the pavements were littered with rubble. The street gradually became busier and busier as Italian soldiers made their evening promenade. Evacuation laws were in force in Derna and not a single woman was to be seen. The entire female population of the town had been sent deep into Cyrenaica and there were very few men in civilian clothes. Those who remained in the city were engaged in one business. Speculation. There were few German soldiers in Derna, mostly anti-aircraft gunners, Luftwaffe officers and hospital staff. As I crossed the junction of two narrow streets, a mixed Italian-German military police patrol passed me. All the policemen were heavily armed and focused. They didn't even notice me, and soon turned down a dark alley. I walked down a narrow alley that led me to a small vacant lot where Luftwaffe vehicles were parked. Keeping to the shadows, I approached the car park. I had been here before and knew it was guarded by sentries. Crouching down, I crept behind the fence until I reached the corner. Through the gaps in the fence I could see the vague outlines of cars. There were at least a hundred of them, cars of all types. This was a Luftwaffe motor pool and repair station. I knew that repair shops with expensive equipment were located somewhere in the back. Ten minutes passed, and I was beginning to wonder where the sentries had gone when suddenly a bright light flooded the whole car park. I dropped to the ground and crawled to where a thick shadow fell from the fence. A Luftwaffe sentry marched less than a metre away from me, holding his rifle and stamping his step on the gravel. He was making his duty rounds. Two minutes later the lights went out and everything went dark again. I could not understand why the car park should be so brightly lit, but Donay was constantly exposed to air raids, and if any large warship of the British Navy had been off the coast it would have blown the car park to smithereens. The sentry returned to his guardhouse. As he opened the door, a streak of light flashed, which quickly disappeared. I climbed over the fence and sneaked to look at the nearest cars. 
trying not to hit anything, not to make too much noise. I moved past cars, motorbikes, armoured cars, light tanks armed with machine guns, trucks and limousines. That's how I got around the whole car park. There was a narrow, unguarded driveway leading to the main street, so I had to choose a car close to it, because it would be very difficult to get out a car located in the centre. The sentries would immediately grab I walked along the driveway and saw what I was looking for, an English Bedford Jeep. I could think of no better vehicle for my trip. At that moment the arc lights flashed, and the car park was as bright as day again. I ran around the Bedford, ducked under a nearby lorry, crawled under it, ducked low, rushed to the fence, climbed over it and jumped to the ground. Breathing heavily, I listened. The stomping of the sentry's boots, coming from the far side, was slowly approaching. Raising my automatic rifle, I took the safety off. If the sentry saw me, he would call out to me or stop and shoot, but all was bypassed. The sentry typed a step without looking left or right. The arc lamps went out. After a minute, the door of the guardhouse slammed shut. I realised that the sentry had gone inside, and then I realised that he was making his rounds every fifteen minutes, and in the intervals he kept his nose to the ground. Every quarter of an hour, the lights come on for two minutes and the sentry goes round the car park. This method of guarding was pioneered in Poland, where sentries serving in the dark were often found murdered, but it was a mystery to me why the lights were switched on here in Africa. Had the Arabs learnt to kill sentries too? I got up and walked back to the main street, wondering how I could get the bedford into the driveway and disappear into the darkness. If the engine started and then suddenly stopped, the sentries would open fire, of course, for there were six or eight of them in the guardhouse. I'd better wander around the town and look for a more suitable place to steal a car. I went round street after street in the dark. It wasn't easy, I had to wade through rubble, sticking my feet in window frames, falling into cellars and avoiding impassable places. And at the same time I had to keep an eye on the sentries who stood in the darkness without moving. It was a lost cause, and I soon tired of the hopeless search. From some house came laughter and the strumming of a guitar. I soon found myself at the foot of a staircase, the broken steps of which led down to a cellar, evidently a sort of tavern where Italians washed down their exploits with red wine, listening to the noise of voices and Italian speech. I wondered if there were any Germans among them. At that minute I heard the rhythmic stomping of nail-studded boots and crawled under the mangled lorry. Ten seconds later four German field policemen appeared and descended into the pub. Soon a shout came from there, in the characteristic German guttural manner. The music died down, the gurgling, drunken singing broke off, and someone shouted an Italian swear word at the German policeman. This was followed by a blow, the policeman's fist came down on the one who had shouted, and a body flew out of the door, hit the steps with a sickening sound and froze. This had evidently made an impression on the other customers in the pub. There was such silence that the rustling of the glass bead curtain hanging at the entrance to the cellar could be heard. The same voice with a German accent uttered a few questions in Italian. A police non-commissioned officer asked about me, a German soldier walking alone, probably on foot, probably in Italian uniform, from the front, one of the Italians who was braver than the others, or maybe he had drunk more red wine, answered him. He assured the policeman that they had not seen a man matching that description. Then a police non-commissioned officer told this heroic company who to look for and what to do if they met. During this briefing there was a heart-rending howl of sirens, and the policeman leapt out of the cellar and ran towards the main street. Not a sound came from the cellar. I decided that the Italians had left from the back. I got out from under the wreck of the lorry and quickly ran to the same place where the policeman had gone. Commands were heard in the harbour. The heavy 80mm anti-aircraft guns were preparing for a new battle. The stamping of boots could be heard in the street. Sometimes I heard voices that sounded as if from the grave. Obviously there were bomb shelters under the ruins, but I did not like them. A single bomb would hit these piles of rubble and the shelters would be covered, and their occupants would have no need of a grave digger. I crossed the street quickly and ran down the alley to the car park. I now knew how I would get the trophy British Jeep away from the Luftwaffe car park. Taking my former position behind the fence, I adjusted my automatic rifle so that it would be close at hand and waited to see if anyone would show up nearby. The air raid had obviously been announced well in advance. The aeroplane should have arrived long ago, but there was silence in Der Nie. 
Not far from where I was sitting, someone shouted in Italian, No fumare, no smoking, probably fearing that those awful Englishmen would recognize even the light of a cigarette from above. The silence only increased the fear, but then the roar of engines came from the darkness. The aeroplanes were already over the city. They flew as low as possible over the plateau and popped out from behind the cliff at the foot of which the town lay. But no matter what tricks the British pilots, they could not deceive the vigilance of anti-aircraft gunners. The 88mm cannon sounded like a great organ, shells in a measured roaring rhythm. One after another flew into the brightly lit sky, and each of their burst with a trace of plume sharply imprinted against the rocky walls of the plateau. One of the bombers, caught in the intersection of the searchlight beams, suddenly separated from the formation and flew towards the sea. Its tail blazed bright flames and the aircraft, describing an arc falling to the ground, but he was destined to reach it only in the form of small debris. He exploded in the air. In the sky, like a flock of fireflies, hung on parachutes flare bombs, flooding the city with a blindingly bright light. Everything was visible, down to the smallest detail. But these bombs did not shine for long. Say, 20mm automatic anti-aircraft. Gun shot them down like targets at a firing range. The pearly threads of its tracer shells flew upwards, crossing the darkness, and one by one extinguished those lamps of death that hung from the black sky ceiling. The first series of bombs fell in the harbour, and great fountains of water shot up into the sky. A dozen bombs hit the main street, blowing up the pavement or what was left of it. Many hitherto intact walls fell on top of the ruins. Six metres away a fan of machine-gun bullets scattered over the Uftwefe vehicles standing in the vacant lot. I saw the sparks they shot out of the metal surfaces that came in their path. And then I heard the loud whistle of a bomb coming straight at me. I fell face down. There was a deafening rumble, the ground shook, and there was silence. The bomb fell, but it didn't explode. And I realised that fate itself was telling me that I couldn't go any further. As I lifted my head above the pile of bricks behind which I was lying, I saw the tail of a 500-pound bomb sticking out of the ground only four and a half metres away from me. It was a sign from above that spurred me into action. These unexploded bombs are not to be trusted. They have a bad habit of exploding after long thought. I didn't wait for it to happen and literally flew over the fence. Somewhere behind me a second bomb fell. The blast wave hit me in the back and I fell to the ground. I thought my spine was going to break. Suddenly, right under my nose, my automatic rifle rumbled, scattering flames and bullets all around. I accidentally pressed the trigger. It rumbled as if they were shooting right above my ear. A bomb had hit the guardhouse and flames were shooting out. It was burning with such vigour as if it had been fuelled by compressed air. There were screams from somewhere, but life is cheap in war, and who's going to rescue casualties now? I rolled onto my back, pulled a new magazine out of my pouch and inserted it into the machine gun. Somewhere not far away, a building collapsed with a ground-shaking rumble, raising a cloud of dust, and a spotlight stabbed into it like a razor blade into a throat. I jumped to my feet and ran among the cars and lorries, hoping that no bomb would hit it before I got out of here in the beautiful jeep I'd spotted. The burning guardhouse was brightly illuminating the entire car park. God forbid the bombers should take this fire as an invitation to drop another series of bombs there. I didn't think about sentries and military policemen. The car I had chosen was still in one piece. I climbed into the cab and pressed the starter, but the engine was silent. Then I pressed the pedal again and it started. The left-hand steering wheel didn't bother me. I'd driven cars like this before. At that minute a parachute with a brightly burning flare bomb landed right in front of the car's radiator. I depressed the clutch and the AB Bedford moved out of the way, driving past the blindingly flaming bomb that illuminated my departure. Finally I turned into the driveway and found myself in darkness. The massive L-shaped bumpers of the British car crashed into the flimsy gate leaves and blew them to pieces. No one shouted after me, no one ordered me to stop. There were no sentries or military policemen in sight. They were hiding in well-equipped underground bomb shelters designed and built by the German rear services. Such bomb shelters made it possible to wait out the bombing without much inconvenience. I drove down the main street without switching on my headlights. The jeep made its way among the doors, windows, troughs and other objects, debris and rubbish lying around, and no one tried to stop it. Soon I reached the beach near where my cave was located. It took me less than five minutes to load my stuff into the back of the truck. 
after which I unscrewed the petrol cap and hastily almost lit a match to check how much fuel was left. When I came to my senses, I stuck the muzzle of a machine gun into the tank. When I pulled it out, I was relieved to see that the blue steel was 15 centimetres covered with petrol, so I wouldn't have to refuel. There would be nowhere to get it unless I pumped it out of someone else's tank with a hose, by blasting it into the owner's skull, of course. Petrol meant salvation for me. British planes were still bombing the city, and military policemen were smoking in bomb shelters when I pulled onto the road through the low mountain range of Elakdar, leading further into western Cyrenaica. It was only after leaving Derna behind that I felt how tired I was. The night I spent in Derna flew by very quickly. As I made the last turn on the road from the beach to the mountain plateau a few kilometres west of the town, I was surprised to notice that a new day was already dawning in the east. The road was in a terrible state and the climb up it was very dangerous. A glance out of the right-hand window at the darkness beyond the narrow strip of gravel where the bottomless cliff was three hundred metres deep sent shivers down my spine. I had driven along this stretch of road ten times before and knew well what awaited me. When I first rode here in April, I think it was a day after the Australian and New Zealand units of the British Army had retreated along this road, the journey reminded me of balancing on a rope stretched over a precipice. In retreating, the enemy had endeavoured to put it out of action for a long time. The road west of Derna was a serpentine road, a combination of sharp turns and equally steep climbs. Drivers with weak nerves have nothing to do here. The road here had no less than 60 steep turns, and since the edge of the cliff stretched, the British troops spared no effort to mark almost every turn with piles of rubble. Explosions made many craters. Any grief, however, can be helped. The British themselves suggested to us a way of solving this problem, and for free. In their rapid retreat, they left behind thousands of metal fuel barrels, which were used as building material. For the first time in the history of the war in Libya up to the present, the Italians were successful. After filling the craters with these barrels, they covered them with stones and gravel and achieved a success in road repair that no one could surpass. From that very moment, the future of the Italian troops in the Libyan campaign was assured. They were for the most part engaged in building and repairing roads, of which more and more were needed. Italians grumbled, cursed Rommel, swore and poured their grief with red wine. But the network of roads was growing, covering the entire coastal zone of Libya. However, the Italians had the alternative of besieging Tobruk or fighting on the front east of it. Of course, they preferred the former. They did not like the barbed wire-covered front line, especially when the bayonets of Australian, British, Indian and other units of the British Army were peering out from behind it. The sun was rising in the red sky, resembling a huge ball of fire. I stopped my jeep and climbed out of the cab. I was all alone. Some green pine trees were visible, making the scenery very lively. How pleasant it was to rest my eyes on them, weary of the sun-scorched world where dust clouds rose instead of trees. These were the fringes of the subtropics of Cyrenaica, an oasis in the suburbs of hell in the face of the Libyan desert. For a while I admired the scenery and enjoyed the chirping of the birds on the slope. After wetting my throat with cool water, I walked around my new car. There was no swastika on it yet. On the front fender, however, a British symbol had been painted with great skill. The head of a knight in a medieval helmet with the visor down in yellow, blue and red colours. Beneath it were the numbers for the number of the compound, surrounded by a white square border. I did not know what this symbol meant, and it was of no value to me. In German military records this jeep was listed under spoils of war and was probably not registered with any of the African Corps formations. The engine went into the cab, which was not very convenient in desert conditions. I checked the oil, it seemed quite dirty and needed special attention. The radiator was full and in the boot I found a spare wheel. I decided that the cab roof would have to be removed. It was very hot during the day, and at night the windscreen was fogging up from the cold. Someone had taken the wipers off. And in the morning I felt like I was driving in some kind of milky fog. Besides, if it came to shooting, the cab roof would only get in the way. You'd have to stop, get out and pull the trigger, not knowing if you'd have time to get into the cab and continue on your way. There was the hum of a powerful engine in the front. Someone was coming down the road. I stopped looking round the jeep, jumped into my seat and set off. A big five-tone Fiat truck was coming towards me, and I stepped on the gas. The chauffeur, with a hazy look in his eyes and a black beard, 
waved at me and drove past. I hoped they hadn't missed the Bedford in Durham and put sentries everywhere to ask everyone who passed by if they'd seen my jeep. I decided that I had to change the appearance of my car, otherwise I would eventually run into someone who would accuse me of stealing a British trophy car from the Luftwaffe. I drove at full speed hoping to get to a place where I could do the job without prying eyes. After an hour on Via Balbia, I turned onto a narrow sandy country lane lined with dense bushes. Driving around sharp, ragged corners of rocks, I reached a wasteland the size of a football field. At the far end of it, I could see the ruins of a shed that had burned down not long ago, but under its roof of corroded corrugated iron I could shelter from the sun. Leaving the jeep at the edge of the wasteland, I looked around, but apart from the chirping of small birds, a lizard flitting through the bushes, and the creak of rusty iron, I heard and saw nothing. I drove the jeep into a burnt shed, the roof of which gave a decent shade. I knew this place from my days as a valiant Weeha marked soldier, and that was why I had found it so quickly. Three hundred metres away was the sea, and I looked forward to plunging into its waters. When I went round the shed and made sure that there were no tiree or boot prints on the ground, I realised that no one had been here for a long time. Few people knew about this abandoned garage. There were pits made in the cement floor for lubricating cars and half-burned workbenches against the wall. That's all that was left from the old days. After having a lunch of the invariable old man stew and drinking water, I took all my belongings out of the jeep and made a bed in one of the pits. It was at least a metre deep, and I could easily turn it into a trench in case the military police looked into the shed. After that I got to work on the jeep without delay. At the sight of the huge number of nuts and bolts that attached the cab to the body, I decided that the makers of the Bedford had gone a little overboard. It took me several hours to unscrew them. Finally, I removed the clunky square roof and the jeep immediately looked sleeker. The roof, with the windscreen attached to it, fell to the floor with a loud thud. It was a good thing the glass didn't shatter. Having got rid of the excess iron, I climbed into the driver's seat and examined the results of my labours. I was very pleased with them. I now had a clear view from all sides. Towards evening, I fixed the machine gun swivel on the dashboard and extended it slightly onto the bonnet. Now, having put the machine gun here, I could fire it forwards without getting up from the seat and by resting it on the bonnet if necessary. I could fire in the opposite direction, over the boot. When night fell, the jeep was completely transformed. Having greased it from the outside with waste oil, I bombarded it with sand, which covered the pattern and numbers on the fender and also changed its colour. Now my car will blend in with the desert. I've come up with the perfect camouflage for it. While I was working, I was covered head to toe in engine oil and sand. But as the last ray of sunlight burned out, I realised I was too tired to do any more washing. I wrapped myself in a piece of old tarpaulin and fell asleep in the muddy pit, satisfied with the job I had done. As I ran barefoot through the bushes to the shore and dove into the sea, the first rays of the sun rising over the Mediterranean Sea dispelled the remnants of gloom. By the time I had wiped the dirt off my body with a petrol-soaked rag, a new hot day had begun. I didn't need a towel. I put on the clean shorts I brought with me and burned the old ones soaked in machine oil. That was the end of my transformation. Barefoot, naked from the waist down and without headgear, but with my automatic rifle in my hand, I began to make my way through the bushes to the shed where my jeep was parked. But here an unpleasant surprise awaited me. Two Arabs in colourful clothes, who were members of an Italian police patrol that rode on camels, entered the ruined shed. I felt as if I had grown attached to the place, shifting my gaze from the two men who had disappeared behind the door to the big fat scorpion a few inches from my feet. Paragraph 9 of the Desert Service Regulations. My mind raced. Nor do not walk barefoot, lest you step on the nests of various insects, the stings of which may cause infectious diseases, and also lest you be fatally stung by scorpions. I had completely forgotten about snakes too. But the Arab policemen were more dangerous to me than all biting creatures and crawling creepers, for they had come to arrest me and put me in the hands of a firing squad. Stealthily I crossed the wasteland. I walked along the corrugated wall of the shed, which was riddled with holes, and took the safety off my automatic rifle and peered cautiously inside. Lord of the Arabs had boots on his feet, obviously an officer. He stood on the edge of the repair pit and looked at my belongings lying there. The other was looking at the jeep with interest. Judging by his bare feet, he was a private, 
Turning to the officer, he exchanged a few words with him in Arabic, a language I did not know. Both had carbines ready to fire. The officer lowered the muzzle of the carbine into the hole and, catching the muzzle of my uniform, pulled it up. At the same minute a second Arab wiped the oil and sand off the fender of my car and pointed to the officer's English sign. They quickly exchanged a few phrases. Their excitement was growing and I realized they were up to something. Holding my assault rifle at the ready, I stood in the doorway. My movement alone was enough. These children of the desert had instant reaction. In one swift movement they turned in my direction, simultaneously raising their carbines to fire. I fired a burst from my automatic rifle. Fountains of dust and cement rose from the floor. An officer fell into a hole, and a private curled up on the floor by the jeep. In a few leaps I was at the pit. One glance was enough to realize that the man lying there was dead. The other Arab groaned, then jerked his arms and legs frantically, and then also gave up. I inserted a new magazine into the machine gun. Grabbing two grenades, I jumped out through the hole in the wall closest to me, ran round the shed and into the bush. I quickly moved fifty paces away from the barn, keeping behind the bushes, and crawled under a thorn bush, ignoring the pricking thorns. From there I watched the vacant lot, listening to see if any foreign sounds reached my ears. But there was silence, only the loud pounding of my heart. The morning was quiet. Even the birds had not stopped chirping, as if they had long ago become accustomed to the gunshots. Watching and listening, I tried to figure out why the Arabs were so excited to find a British sign on the jeep. Did they recognize the stolen vehicle, or did they think it belonged to a British intelligence unit? They no doubt had a clear objective, otherwise they would not have searched so persistently. Suddenly some rustling at the far end of the wasteland made me turn my head and raise my automatic. But I was in vain to be alarmed. There were two stabled camels. The Arabs, judging by the small sacks strapped to their sides, were Arab policemen. When I was sure that there was no one else in the wasteland, I got up and, looking round and keeping out of the bushes and into the open, walked towards the camels. As I approached them, they stretched their lips, exposing large teeth. The sight of them was quite intimidating. Nevertheless, I managed to break the branches to which the camels were tied and let them go free. But the camels would not budge, continuing to chew. So I threw a handful of gravel at them, and they scampered away and were soon out of sight. When I returned to the barn, I checked the officer's pockets, as he was the only one wearing a uniform. The second Arab was dressed in a burn, a hooded woolen cloak like a tablecloth wrapped round his body, and girded with a belt and cartridge case, he looked like a pirate. I found nothing of interest in the officer's pockets, and having finished my examination, left it at that. I lowered the burrow-clad private into the same hole where his chief was lying, and covered them both with a piece of old tarpaulin. They would be found soon, I had no doubt of it. The police patrol on camels, created by the Italians especially for travelling round the desert, was not a bad idea at all. I had no doubt that the two Arabs had been sent from Derna on a mission to capture me, if they saw my car tyre tracks in the sand. They had succeeded in finding me, but it was a pity that the German military police had put the dirty work on the Arabs' shoulders and I had to kill them. Or maybe the Italian police sent them. I did feel sorry for the murdered Arabs, but my own life was at stake. I defeated them in a fair fight. That was their fate. It wasn't up to them to catch deserters. At least not the German ones. Did I have any other choice? Should I have surrendered to fall into the clutches of the German police who would have put me against the wall? If I had not killed them, I would be lying dead now, for their fingers were on the triggers of their carbines. It was two on one, but I was ahead of them. Was I really supposed to wait until they started shooting at me? We are at war, where such things happen all the time. But that thought didn't bring me any relief. The only thing that comforted me was that when I saw that they had not returned, a search party would be sent from Derna to find them and bring them to the ground with honour. My conscience tormented me, although I had assumed from the beginning that something like this was going to happen. Knowing that a death sentence awaits him if he is caught, the deserter is prepared to do anything. No matter what he does, his life is in constant danger. He can do no worse than what he has done for which, under wartime conditions, he is liable to be shot. I put my belongings into the jeep, which consisted of water, petrol, oil and ammunition, and felt relieved. I was dressed in a clean shirt and shorts, making sure the area around me was as deserted as before, 
I jumped on the seat, drove out of the barn, crossed the wasteland, and rushed down the sandy track to Via Balbia. In the early evening I passed Tometa, a small village in Cyrenaica. I drove slowly along its only street, endeavouring to ascertain what units were stationed here. But seeing no military personnel, I turned back and stopped at a small roadside inn. When I got out of the jeep, my car was surrounded by a flock of boys who crawled out of every crevice like rats. They looked at the jeep with big eyes and pointed at the automatic rifle hanging on my shoulder. I must have seemed like a real hero to them. When I entered the inn, the Italian soldiers behind the counter, seeing my German uniform, saluted me. This was followed by the inevitable invitation for a drink, and soon my stomach was filled with red wine, sour but very refreshing. My offer to pay for the drinks was not accepted. They would not go for it, the soldiers declared. After all, we Germans are here to get them victory. At least that's what they thought. Soon I knew everything about Tomit, what state its garrison was in and what security measures had been taken, namely none. I was already considering whether to spend the rest of the day and all night here, but then there was the trumpeting roar of a motorbike engine. I didn't have to look out the window to see who had arrived. Only a BMW motorbike makes that kind of roar. I was surrounded by a dozen Italian soldiers who were crackling like typewriters. Turning to the innkeeper, I asked where the toilet was. Smiling broadly, he lifted the counterboard and led me into the corridor. As I entered there, I noticed two men in German uniforms enter the inn. I wondered if they were messengers passing through or military policemen looking for someone, maybe me. The toilet was a shed in the courtyard. Natrina, the innkeeper said, pointing at it and went back to his place. Making sure he wasn't looking in my direction, I quickly ran round the house and, jumping out into the street, noted to myself happily that my jeep was far away from the door so no one would see me leave. The boys were still crowded around my car, and right behind it was a BMW motorbike with a sidecar. I quickly jumped up to it, fumbled with my hand for the ignition wiring harness, and ripped it off and took it with me. I gently pressed the throttle, and the engine started smoothly. After a short drive, I pushed the pedal all the way down and sped out of the village. There, I threw away the wiring and laughed, releasing the tension. If these two Germans were military policemen, they were probably already cursing themselves for their carelessness. But if they were messengers, or just people travelling on their own business, they'd probably beat the boys up, thinking they were the ones who'd torn the wires. But be that as it may, I was firmly convinced of one thing. They would not be able to start the motorbike, and this thought reassured me. At sunset I reached Barca. This town stood in the centre of the relatively fertile area of Cyrenaica, colonised by the Italians, about 60 kilometres from the port of Benghazi. The streets of Barca were a cluster of potholes, ditches with crumbling edges, cobbles and rubbish. Along the lanes were Italians in uniform, Arabs wrapped in their white burners, and crowds of frantically gesticulating Arab children. Among them stood out as bright spots, proud signorinas with sparkling eyes, tastefully dressed in colourful outfits. They moved among the crowd with graceful, easy gait, despite their high heels. I stopped at the door of the hotel on the main street, deciding that I shouldn't stray too far from the proudly parading black-haired signorinas. The closer I was, the better. I hoped to get to know some of them better, but more on that later. The hotel, surrounded by neat lawns and trees, stood a little at the back of the street, giving the impression of being luxurious and cosy. I walked past the lawns to its door, thinking that there might be other Germans here, travelling to or from the front. But I hoped to spend only one night here. In this town lived a man whom I knew well. He was Bean Omar, whom I had befriended when I had rescued him from the clutches of the Italian police. But first I had to find him, because I didn't know where he lived. As I waited for the porter to arrive, I saw German military caps on the hooks at the entrance to the restaurant. I took off the safety of my parabellum, which was in my trouser pocket. I must not forget to be vigilant. I was well aware of the danger I was in at this hotel, but I needed a room to sleep in a rear town. I could not sleep in the street. Behind me the door opened and, turning round, I found myself face to face with the Italian major. As I stood at attention and saluted dashingly, I wondered what he was doing here for he was standing behind the porter's desk. Buena sera, Caprale, good evening, non-commissioned officer. He greeted me, and I noticed that his uniform was made by a good tailor, and that his black velvet collar was decorated with red and gold buttonholes. I was confused for a moment, 
but then I told him that I needed a room. That can be arranged, he replied. German soldiers often stay with me. Are you from the front line? he asked. I confirmed this and added that I was travelling to Tripoli as a messenger. Ah, Tripoli. He sighed dreamily and, opening the visitor's register, held out a pen for me to write my name in it. How I wish I were in Tripoli now. It is not a city, but a jewel, a music. He seemed too enthusiastic and, judging by the expression on his face, was a typical gigolo. Hey, but I have to live in this thieving Arab brothel where they have no concept of culture. He intrigued me, and I asked him how it was that he, with the rank of major, was working in a hotel as a mere clerk. Mm, no, he exclaimed. I am the commander of the artillery division stationed here. I bought this hotel, and as the front line is far away now, I combine service with business. I hope those damned English won't come back here again, or I'll have to go to defend our poor Italy again. He must have thought that I admired his story, but I was shocked to the core to see a major who, while on active service, manages to keep a hotel. The Italian rang a bell with a graceful gesture, and like a flock of rats, four Arab boys came rushing towards me. The major said something to them, but I could not make out what, and then explained to me that he had told them to take me to my room and my things. You have some things with you, don't you? He asked me rather dismissively. I replied that my things were in the car, but that I was not going to take them with me to my room, as I would be leaving early in the morning. He again said something quickly to one of the boys, who answered him with equal speed, if not faster, and I went off in the company of my escorts to the jeep, leaving them waiting on the pavement. I climbed into the car and found my toilet articles. Taking an overcoat, I discreetly wrapped a machine gun and a couple of grenades in it and handed it to one of the boys. We went back to the hotel and one of them remained squatting on the pavement, waiting for the jeep. The room I was taken to was large and full of air. I tipped the boys and they left. The large doors opened onto a balcony overlooking the road. I noticed at once that it was about three metres to the ground from it. Down below the balcony was a driveway that led to the back of the hotel. There wasn't much furniture in the room. There was a small dressing table beside the bed, and the shower stall was covered by a curtain. Rolling out my overcoat, I stuffed my automatic rifle and grenades under the bedspread, undressed and hurried to get under the shower. But I almost jumped out of there. The water was as hot as boiling water. The water pipes had obviously been laid on the ground, and the merciless sun was heating them up. I turned the tap and managed to wash myself without getting boiled. Putting on my shorts, I collapsed on the bed, fighting the drowsiness. It was getting dark outside the window. I lay there, contemplating my next move. I needed to get to Benghazi, mainly to send some things to my... Benghazi was the nearest civilian post office to the front, from which I could send a letter or parcel without fear that it, like all correspondence from the front, would fall into the hands of the military censors. I did not know what I was going to do in the near future, or what the future held for me, if indeed I had one, so I was anxious to get some of my things home. Once I had them, my mother would no longer worry about me, for she had probably already been informed of my escape from the army. In such cases, the Gestapo acts very quickly. I shaved and dressed, deciding to walk around the city and look for Ben Omar. I had no doubt that if someone broke into the room in my absence, the machine gun and grenades under the bedspread would not be visible. Switching on the light, I left the room and was about to go into the foyer when suddenly I heard voices speaking German. I froze in place, speechless. Taking a few more steps, I saw the porter's desk. Behind it I saw the familiar figure of an artillery major, who was also the owner of the hotel, and in front of him stood four German military policemen, armed with automatic rifles, whom I had least expected to see here. Their military police badges gleamed on their chests, in sharp contrast to their dull steel helmets. The eldest among them was asking the major questions in Italian in a harsh voice, and the latter was gesticulating with the vigour of a beached fish, beating its tail against the sand. Ersai, sai, tenente. Yes, yes, lieutenant, he shouted. It's him, the messenger, W.B. assured the Germans. And then it struck me. He was talking about me. I immediately realised that the military policeman knew that I was staying at the hotel. I heard them asking the major to show them my room. I rushed back. I burst into my room, locked the door, sprang to my bed, pulled my automatic rifle and grenades from under the covers, and ran to the window, although it was already dark. 
I could see that the passage under my balcony was clear all the way to the intersection with the street on which the hotel stood. I heard the stomping of boots on the stairs, and I realized that if the policeman broke the door and jumped out on the balcony before I reached that street, I could not escape. I had to hold them off until I got to the end of the driveway and into my jeep. I took out one grenade and made a stretch grenade out of it. At that moment, the door handle jerked open. No open up. Hmm. A voice commanded in German. Ara, now I replied, and then I jumped out onto the balcony, over the railing, and, hovering for a second on my outstretched arms, jumped to the ground. When I landed, the muzzle of my automatic rifle struck me painfully on the head. Jumping to my feet, I ran down the driveway. As I ran past the entrance to the hotel, I threw another grenade at it. As I rounded the corner, I heard the grenade I had left in the bedroom explode. Wood and glass shards whistled through the air. Ten more steps and hiding behind pedestrians, I jumped into my jeep. I pressed the starter. The engine roared. People screamed at me. The Arab boy guarding the car tried to jump in, demanding payment, but the jeep lurched forward and he fell off the step. At that moment, a second grenade exploded at the entrance to the hotel. As I rounded the corner, I miraculously avoided a collision with a cart pulled by a mule. I did not switch on my headlights. I could not afford such a luxury. Soon, after making many turns and passing through many streets, I found myself in a densely populated Arab neighborhood. Here and there I came upon doors covered with curtains of glass beads from which light streamed in. At last I came to a street so narrow that there was no more than an inch of space between the jeep and the walls on either side. I stopped, fearing I was at a dead end, and decided to back up. As I pulled into a wide street, an Arab boy skidded onto the footplate of my jeep, gesticulating frantically. I didn't have time to chase him away, so I stepped on the gas and the car sped forward. But the boy had a firm grip on something and would not jump off the stick. After a hundred meters more in a maze of narrow streets, I stopped abruptly, switched off the engine, and turned to the boy in a rage. But the machine gun in my hands did not seem to frighten him at all. He continued to gesticulate and chatter away. I caught only one word in the rapid flow of his speech, Sorella, and realized that he was offering me his sister. This was a common thing in Barca, and I took it calmly. Many Arabs were engaged in procuring, for them it was as much business as selling dates. It occurred to me that this boy might help me to hide somewhere with the car for a while. Hmm. Parler piano, amico. I said to him, asking him to speak slower as I did not understand anything. Then I explained to him that I needed to disappear with the jeep, and quickly. I knew he would not hesitate to hide me, for Arabs hate Italians with a fierce hatred. I quickly convinced him that I had quarrelled with the Italian soldiers, and now they were after me. To reinforce his hatred of Italians, and his desire to introduce me to his sister and hide me, I gave him a pile of lyre, which disappeared as quickly as water disappears in dry sand. He climbed into the cab and sat down beside me indicating for me to drive down an alley plunged into darkness. The streets were narrow again, and I was afraid that my jeep would get stuck in the alleys flanked by mud-brick houses, but the boy pointed stubbornly ahead. I made several turns, repeatedly hitting the corners of the Arab houses. At last my guide signalled me to stop. It was very dark, and the mud walls were not more than a foot thirty centimetres from the sides of my car. Without getting up from my seat, I could touch the walls with my hand. Where to now? I asked. No memento, replied the little Arab. He climbed out onto the bonnet and jumped off it onto the ground. I'll be back in a minute, he hissed and immediately disappeared into the darkness. I took the parabellum out of my pocket, made myself comfortable with the machine gun, and prepared to fight back if necessary. I wondered if I could get out of here in the jeep if I had to run away. In this narrow alley, you can only go forwards or backwards. Obviously, I had got into the heart of the Arab neighborhood. The silence around me depressed me. I moved towards the machine gun and took the safety off. My hands fumbled for the machine gun belt. It was inserted just right. At least I could clear a path if I needed to. Five minutes passed, and with each passing minute, the weight became more and more unbearable. And then there was the damn darkness. Finally, I heard a door slam shut somewhere ahead of me with a sharp click. Then there was the clatter of bare feet on the cobblestones, and a figure loomed in the darkness. The little Arab was coming back. He climbed onto the bonnet and slid into the seat beside me. Hmm, drive a little further, he said, and my friends will hide you. 
I looked at him grimly, not knowing if I could trust him, but I had no choice. I couldn't stay here, trapped by the walls of the houses. Sensing that I didn't trust him, the boy put a hand on my shoulder. Go on, you'll be all right, he whispered. I started the engine and drove on down the dark alley, the width of which I could judge only by the edges of the roofs that hung down to the right and left, dark against the lighter sky. After a hundred metres we came to a wider street that crossed the alley at right angles. Right in front of my jeep's nose, the light of a street lamp flashed. Stop, Amico, the boy whispered. At the same moment, a figure jumped on the bumper of the jeep. This is a friend, my guide said softly, and spoke to the newcomer in Arabic. There was an exchange of gestures and excited hissing. His name is Ibrim, the boy told me in Italian. He will take us to a house where you can stay. I shook my head doubtfully. What about my car? I can't leave it in the middle of the street. Don't worry, he reassured me. We'll put it in the yard behind the gate, and no one will see it. These words gave me confidence that the Arabs were not going to deceive me, and we set off. Ibrim sat on the bonnet and, as we drove into a new street, showed me where to go. Five minutes later we stopped in front of a large house, and Ibrim vanished like a shadow into the darkness. Soon he returned, accompanied by another Arab. They whispered about something, and then Ibrim and the Arab walked forward and lit a lantern at a large wooden gate that someone had opened from inside. Ibrim lit the way, and the Arab boy made a sign to me to pass through the gate. They immediately closed, and I saw that I was surrounded on all sides by dark figures. Some of them were holding torches switched on. I counted seven or eight Arabs with cartridges on their chests and the latest carbines in their hands. My hand reached for my assault rifle, but the boy put his hand on my shoulder again. Don't be afraid. You're safe now? Easy for him to talk about safety. I could hardly believe it. Ibrim appeared beside me and waved towards the house. Mm, come in, he said, and don't worry. You and your jeep are in a safe place. I wondered where I'd driven into. Maybe it was just a cleverly set trap. But I knew I couldn't let on that I was worried about anything, much less ask any questions, especially with these Arabs with torches pointing their fingers at my jeep, the machine gun and myself. Holding the machine gun in my hands, I jumped from the driver's seat to the ground. The sight of armed figures in the dim light of the street lamps did not inspire me with confidence. I cursed to myself, cursing my stupidity for being in this situation. The thirty-two rounds in the magazine of my automatic and the nine in the parabellum in my trouser pocket gave me some confidence that in case of emergency I would be able to break through to the street. The Arab boy who had brought me here climbed into the chauffeur's seat of my jeep on Ibrim's orders and stayed there while I followed Ibrim into the house. He shone a torch down a narrow corridor, at the end of which the stone steps rose to a door. I felt goosebumps run up my spine. Ibrim knocked on the door, which opened immediately. Behind it stood another Arab whose figure stood out clearly against the light burning inside. He was armed with a parabellum, which protruded from behind a red silk girdle tied around his waist. We stepped inside and he slammed the door behind us. Not a word was uttered, not a greeting. In the light of the oil lamp hanging on the wall, I saw the piercing eyes of the guard, who kept his gaze fixed on my automatic. The Arab's eyes were eager to take it from me, and I clutched it tighter to my body. Ibrim pointed to a door that led to another room. Boss, he said in Italian. I nodded and followed him. We entered a large room. The soft glow of two braziers with smouldering coals illuminated it with a diffused light. Ibrim bowed to an Arab dressed in flowing white robes and said something quickly to him. I could not make out the words, but I noticed that the Arab in white was staring at me intently. His black eyes slid over my face, lingered on the iron cross hanging on my chest, and stopped on the automatic rifle. I tilted my head slightly in greeting and waited tensely to see what would happen next. The Arab extended a swarthy hand and said hello to me in clear Italian. I shook his hand, but I thought it was unlikely that I would be able to explain my predicament to a man who was probably connected with the Italian administration. His eyes were intense in my face, as if he wanted to read my thoughts. The look made me uncomfortable. With a broad gesture, he pointed to a mountain of colourful cushions piled on the carpet that covered the floor. Ah, sit down and rest, he said, and sat down cross-legged. I had been with Arabs before, and I knew a little of their customs. I glanced at Ibrim, who was standing beside me, and saw that there was a cheerful light in his dark eyes. 
I was suddenly at ease, and I smiled back at him. Putting the automatic on the soft, thick carpet, I bent down and began to pull my boots off my feet. In an Arab house, before sitting down, a guest must remove his shoes out of respect for his host. Feeling undressed without boots, I made my way to the mountain of cushions the Arab pointed out to me and made myself comfortable on them. The host watched my actions with great interest, though the scrutinizing expression never left his face. My name is Abdul, he said. He spoke in correct, pure Italian, and his voice sounded authoritative and firm. My name is Gunter, I answered. I come from near Tobruk. I thought Abdul looked about fifty or so, but it was hard to judge his age, for his well-groomed beard might have aged him a little. Ibrim sat down across from us. Abdul clapped his hands and a figure slipped out from behind the curtain and stood beside him. They exchanged a few words, and then I realized it was a girl, though only her eyes were visible. The whole figure of the girl was wrapped in a wide, dark garment, and her head was covered with a black cape. Abdul said something to her, and the girl disappeared behind the curtain. Oh, forgive me for speaking my own language in front of you, Abdul said, but not all of us know Italian. It is a pleasure to be your guest, Abdul. This is your home and your language, I replied. The girl returned and placed before us a silver coffee pot, steaming with steam, and a silver tray on which stood fragile cups, such as I had never seen before in my life. The girl took off her cloak and was left in a yashmak of fine cloth, which covered the lower half of her face. Kneeling down, she opened the tiny tap on the coffee pot and poured coffee into the cups. The air was filled with the strong aroma of coffee. The cups were very small, but the coffee was thick and very strong. Small swarthy fingers placed the cup in front of me. The girl lifted her head for a moment, and big dark eyes looked at me. Abdul and Ibrim took their cups and the girl lift. Abdul picked up his cup and said, My home is your home, stranger. No, thank you for your hospitality, Abdul, I replied, and we started drinking coffee. This kind of coffee is brewed only in Turkey and Arab countries. Very strong, sweet and savoury. How pleasant it was to drink it in small sips. I put the empty cup on a silver tray decorated with magnificent carving and chasing, and turned to Abdul. Hey, now that I've had coffee with you, you probably want to know who I am and why I've come here. I asked. Abdul nodded. But before he could answer, there was a knock at the door, and an Arab in unimaginable rags entered the room. He bowed his head to Abdul and spoke quickly in Arabic, and I could sense from his tone that the matter was important. Ibrim threw me a glance in which I read joyful surprise. Abdul asked the ragged man questions to which he answered, and I, noticing the joy in Ibrim's eyes, tensed again. But the Arab soon left, closing the door behind him. Abdul turned to me, put his hand over mine, and a satisfied chuckle escaped his smiling lips. It turns out that you have trashed the hotel, you foreigner, and the Italian garrison is on alert in the city and German and Italian military police cars are snooping around looking for you. Abdul said all this in such a cheerful voice as if he had been told a very funny anecdote. I looked at Ibrim, who laughed and clapped himself cross-legged. All of this really surprised me. What are they rejoicing about, especially after they found out what I'd done at the hotel? Abdul lost all his restraint, grabbed my hand and shook it violently. You've done more to them than all the English saboteurs put together. More than anyone else, he grinned. But we found out about you yesterday, Abdu added, and opened a small box he had taken down from the shelf. He pulled out a folded piece of paper and handed it to me. Look what it says here, Tedesco. I unfolded the paper and saw a photograph of myself. Underneath it was printed in bold letters, wanted by the police. Then in German, Italian and Arabic, it offered to bring me to the police, alive or dead, as a deserter, thief and murderer. A detailed description of my appearance included my height and age. Abdul put his hand on my shoulder. And who do you think brought me this paper? He asked. But before I could answer, he said, Medumar. That was the name of an Arab who was going to be imprisoned for stealing a lorry from Mussolini's soldiers. On the road to Akroma, I rescued him from the Italians who were taking him there, and on the way they decided to shoot him. Abdul and Ibrim looked at me intently. Yes, mate. Abdul exclaimed. Ben Omar brought me a poster with your picture just yesterday. He took it off the board outside the town office. 
brought it here and explained that it was a picture of the German soldier who pulled him out of the clutches of the Italian policeman when they were about to kill him. Abdul clapped his hands and the girl reappeared from behind the curtain. Without any request from those gathered, she knelt down, filled tiny cups of coffee and lift. She must have been standing behind the curtain waiting for Abdul to call her. Who is this Abdul? I thought as we drank our coffee in silence. Why did Ben Omar bring this poster to you? I asked. And where is he now? Abdul looked at me with a long look. Ben Omar is my brother. He left this morning, but not far away at all. You'll see him if you stay with us, and after what you did at the hotel, you just can't not stay. He grinned again and added, Tell us why you escaped from the German army. We want to hear it from your own lips. Speak up, don't be shy. We want to help you. Mibrim nodded in agreement. Yes, we will hide you. You helped Ben Omar, besides. We hate the Italians who wanted to turn our country into their colony even before this war started. I made myself comfortable and told them the story of my escape from the very beginning to the minute I arrived in this house. They listened without concealing their approval. It was three o'clock in the morning, and I was still telling Abdul and Ibrim about my personal war in the desert, but there was another knock at the door. The same little ragamuffin who had accompanied me to Abdul's house came in. He was very excited and crackled like a machine gun. Abdul and Ibrim jumped to their feet. Hmm, the Italian police, Ibrim explained, are looking for you in the Arab neighborhoods. I quickly put on my boots and grabbed my automatic. Abdul said something hurriedly to the Arab, and I asked Ibrim, Are there many Italian policemen? A lot, he replied. They always come here in large crowds. They don't dare to come here alone. The Arabs exchanged phrases. Abdul grabbed my arm and shook me. Go with Ibrim and don't worry about anything. We won't give you away, he said, and Ibrim was already dragging me out of the room. When the door closed behind us, the corridor was dark, and I was walking with Ibrim's arm around me. When we reached the courtyard, there were a dozen Arabs with rifles, pistols, and cross-body cartridges. They were illuminated by numerous lanterns. Where shall I go now, Ibrim? I asked quickly. The excitement of these men was transferred to me. We will go to the desert. Ibrim answered and shouted something to the crowd. They immediately clustered around my jeep, and two or three of them opened the large wooden gate. Two riders on camels appeared from the far corner of the courtyard. They jumped out of the gate and immediately turned into the street that went past the house. Ibrim shouted again, and the Arabs got into the jeep. Get in quickly, Ibrim said to me, pushing me into the driver's seat. There was no need for a second invitation. I was behind the steering wheel in no time, handing the automatic to Ibrim. I started the engine. Switch on the headlights. As long as we're in town, it's not dangerous, he said, loosening the screw that secured the hinge stand and taking the machine gun off the safety. I marveled at his confident action. Surely he could handle a German MG.34 machine gun. We drove out of the courtyard. The headlights brightly illuminated the street in front of me. For the first time since my landing in Africa, I was driving with my headlights on. Driving through narrow streets with people clinging to the fenders of the car, and with the crowd crammed into the back of the car, ready to use weapons at any moment, was not a pleasant experience. I was too busy following Ibrim's directions to pay attention to the houses we were passing. I kept having to turn from one narrow street to another. The only thing I was sure of was that if we came across a military police patrol, we would meet it with heavy fire. Soon Ibrim signalled me to stop, and I quickly switched off my headlights. What happened? I asked. Nothing, Amy Co. he whispered. We'll wait here for Abdul and Selina. No sooner had he said this than the soft clatter of camel hoofs sounded in the darkness, and soon two riders appeared, hardly recognisable in the darkness. They stopped beside the jeep. Ibrim asked something in a muffled voice, and I recognised Abdul in the man who answered him. As quickly as they had appeared, the riders sped away. Nerm, switch on the headlights now. Army Co, go by the light of the lantern, said Ibrim, and one of the Arabs on the wing showed me where to go. It became more difficult to go forward. I was afraid of running into the walls of the houses. Suddenly the desert spread out in front of us, and it became brighter. Ibrim's hand was pointing ahead. No, see that bright star? Drive straight towards it and you will soon find yourself on a camel trail. 
There may be patrols on the road, he said, and put the machine gun on safety. The jeep rolled across the rocky desert. We drove for about two hours. The horizon brightened, and soon the first rays of the hot sun illuminated the stone wall of the mountain along which we were travelling. I was dead tired after all the adventures of the previous day and night, and riding over the uneven desert surface in the dark. I was exhausted to the max. A dry river opened up on the right, and Ibrim told me to go there. As we meandered among the large rocks, we came to a sharp turn, and the entrance to a cave opened before us. And at the same moment, a shout came from above. When I looked up, I saw two Arabs wrapped in burqas looking down at us. I hit the brake. But Ibrim told me to keep... It's Abdul and Selina, he explained. Oh, how did they get here before us? I asked in surprise as I drove into the wide opening of the cave. They took a shorter route, the camel trail that runs through the mountains, he smiled. And who is Selina? I asked. She is the girl who served us coffee. She is the sister of Abdul and Ben Omar, Ibrim said and told me to stop. I guessed that the rider who rode past us in the courtyard was Abdul, but it did not occur to me that his companion was the girl who was serving us coffee. As soon as we stopped, the Arabs jumped out of the jeep. Not a minute later, the entrance to the cave was camouflaged with camel thorn and English camouflage nets. Despite my fatigue, I couldn't help but admire the speed with which these guys worked. They knew their business well. Are you tired, Amiko? Ibrahim asked. He handed me the automatic rifle and led me deeper into the cave. We walked down a narrow passage, in which there was half a darkness. Suddenly we found ourselves in a wide and spacious hall. From above, through the many openings in the high walls, the bright light of the sun streamed down. Stacks of crates were everywhere. I saw several English barrels of fuel. There were piles of Italian rifles on the floor and the brass sides of shells glinting in the crates. It was a veritable armory. Ibrim led me past several Italian motorbikes. He pulled back a curtain and we entered a small room filled with light. Cushions were scattered on the floor on top of dressed camel and goat skins. A brazier of coals stood in the center, and water bags hung from the walls. The room was missing one wall, and bright sunlight streamed from a hole in the rock. I realized that the opening was high up on the mountainside, and that the floor of the cave was steeply sloping downwards. Below me was an endless desert, and the horizon was lost in the shivering heat of the coming day. I turned to see Ibrim standing beside me. Hmm, ah, beautiful, I exclaimed and pointed to the desert. He nodded. Yes, but not when there is a sandstorm, and made a bed for me out of cushions made of tanned leather. Settle down, Amico, and sleep. You have nothing to fear here. No one knows about this cave but us, and when you wake up you will be in for a surprise. I looked up at him sharply. I hope it won't be an Italian carabinieri. He grinned and pointed to the water bottles on the wall. There's water here. You can drink as much as you like, he said, and went to the curtain that separated the great hall with its piles of weapons from this lovely room. But before he disappeared, he looked at me, and I saw that his eyes shone with merriment. No, Amico, there will be no carabinieri. If any of them came here, it would be a great surprise to myself. See, the curtain fell, and he left. I admired the desert for a while longer. A great cloud of dust was rising in the distance, and slowly, very slowly, it crept towards the rippling waves of heat. Then, hardly able to move my arms from fatigue, I took off my boots, threw the automatic on a pile of cushions, took the parabellum out of my pocket, put it beside the other gun, and immediately fell into a dream.